traditional fasting seminar. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dorothea Voiler. I'm from the University of Hamburg, who's here with us in person. And lurking online, um, listening to us all, paying close attention, is her uh, colleague Pietro Liuzzo um, from the University of Hamburg. And I'm also delighted that we're, um, we're thinking about classics in the broadest sense, not just the classics of the Mediterranean world, but world classics. And Dorothea will be talking to us about um, classical manuscripts of Ethiopia and Eritrea. So lots to learn about this new and exciting project. So thank you very much. I'll let uh, Dorothea um, have her say, and then we'll go to questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, also for the invitation to be here. I'm very happy to uh, be able to present to you the project Vitam and Sahif today. Vitam and Sahif, manuscripts of So, Betem et Sahif, Manuscripts of Ethiopia and Eritrea, aims at creating a portal for data related uh, to the living manuscript tradition of the Ethiopian and Eritrean highlands. Uh, this means encoding and semantically relating descriptions of manuscripts, editions of literary works, records about ancient and modern persons, as well as ancient and modern places. The project is led by Professor Dr. Alessandro Bauzi and is funded within the framework of the Academies program, coordinated by the Union of the German Academies of Science and Humanities, under survey of the Academy of Sciences and Humanities in Hamburg. The funding is provided for 25 years, from 2016 to 2040. The project is hosted by the Heo Ludolf Center for Ethiopian Studies at the University of Hamburg. And by the way, Betjem et Sahif means library in Geus or classical Ethiopic. Betjem et Sahif builds especially upon two previous projects focusing on Ethiopian and Oriental manuscript studies. The first is the ERC project Ethiosphere, which was dedicated to the preservation and scientific analysis of manuscripts located in Ethiopian churches and monasteries. And the second is the ESF Research Networking Program Comparative Oriental Manuscript Studies, which resulted, amongst other, in the publication of the manual Comparative Oriental Manuscript Studies and Introduction. The project Petim et Sahift also benefits strongly from the research conducted at the Heob Ludolf Center during the publication of the Encyclopedia Ethiopica, whose data it inherited as well. Betem et Sahif thus hopes to systematically record most of the available manuscript data related to the Ethiopian tradition. It is structured in several phases, and the first phase focuses on the digitization of historic manuscript catalogues, trying especially to retrieve as much codicological information from these descriptions as possible. And I will speak today about this phase, which is the one currently taking place. In the first part of this presentation, I will give a brief introduction about the Ethiopian manuscript tradition, and then shortly present some technical aspects of our project. And then I will describe some decisions taken during this first year of the project related to user needs. This part will be organized with the first series of data entry user needs, and will be followed by a second about end users needs. So, Ethiopia is located culturally and historically in the midst of Africa and at a contact point both with the Arabian Peninsula through the Red Sea and the Christian Orient through its religious development and close relationship with the Coptic Church. Writing existed in Ethiopia since the first millennium BCE 
and many inscriptions witness the cultural, political, and religious landscape of the Highlands, which is this region here, uh, both in its pre-Christian time and following the conversion of the country to Christianity in the 3rd to 4th century. It is assumed that the Codex was introduced to Ethiopia at the same time as the introduction of Christianity from Egypt. The first texts to be translated were biblical and other Christian texts, whose translation from Greek must have taken place from the 4th century onwards, during the so-called Exumite period. The language of literature at this time was Ge'ez, or classical Ethiopic, an Ethiosemitic language. Despite the larger amount of manuscripts that must have been produced in the Exumite period, there is actually only one manuscript preserved from this period, which is, are the famous Abagarima Gospels that have been dated by radiocarbon dating to the 4th to 7th century. In the political turmoil following the end of the Axumite period in the 10th century, literary production was probably drastically reduced. It resumed then with the ascension to power of the Solomonic dynasty in the 13th century. Now, Arabic Christian texts were translated to Ge'ez, and a substantial amount of original, of original literary works was also produced in Ge'ez. However, during the 16th century invasion of Ahmad Gran, many churches and monasteries were destroyed together with the manuscripts they held. And thus, thus manuscripts start to be abandoned only from the 14th to the 15th century on. Manuscript production continues to this day, especially in rural regions, where printed books remain more expensive than manuscripts. The codex is the most widely used format, and the traditional manuscript material is parchment. The exact amount of Ethiopian manuscripts has been estimated to lie around 200,000, of which around 20,000 are accessible, and of these, only 10,000 are actually described in some form of catalogue. I'm now going to give a, an overview of the technical aspects of our project. The work on the digitization of primary and secondary sources is done in XML, for which the Oxygen XML editor is used. All data is publicly accessible, as it is stored in a GitHub organization with several repositories of which you can see some here. Um, those repositories containing source data are synced via webhooks to our virtual server in Hamburg, where our ExistDB app is hosted. And this is uh, our homepage. This allows data entry users to benefit from a fully synced research environment. We can keep track of each other's progress and immediately visualize our work and navigate between entities. The example for this workflow has been taken from projects as Syriaca.org and Papyri.info, from which our project has inherited a lot. Apart from significantly facilitating research, this workflow also means having a preview of the experience of end users which can therefore be considered from the very first project stages as the web app is developed. Bitamat Sahift is not the only digital project of the Heer Rudolf Center, and it is developed to integrate with other resources being currently developed as the Digital Lexicon Lingua Ethiopica, which is based on the Lexicon Lingua Ethiopica by Dillman, and the Morphological Annotations by the Traces Project. The overall relation among these parts takes Precious as a model. Our data architecture is quite easy and uses TEI as a base data entry format for all types of data. We have records for manuscripts, works, persons and places, which we connect via IDs with one another and validate to our schema, which is a customization of TEI. The website is due to go online by the end of the year and is currently accessible only to members of the center. A full catalog of all Ethiopian manuscripts accessible to us, a clavis of Ethiopian literature, 
and a prosopography and gazetteer of the Ethiopian tradition will be derived from the manuscript, work, places, and person records. I have now come to the end of the technical presentation of Vitim et Sahef, and so now I will present the main user, user needs and our proposed way of dealing with them, starting with those of users doing the data entry work at the current stage of the project. Then I will give a shorter outline of the end user's needs, which we can currently foresee. Whenever possible, I will illustrate the individual problems with examples from the Ethiopian Simkasar, a calendar of hagiographies to be read every day at mass, which was also the subject from, of my master's thesis. The Simkasar was translated from Arabic in the 15th century, and was then repeatedly revised and enhanced with the hagiographies of Ethiopian saints. It is one of the longest and most widespread works of Gehr's literature. As it is needed for the service, at least one manuscript of it is kept in every Ethiopian church, often incorporating the lives of locally important saints. Its character as a translation, its long transmission tradition, and the great variation of its recensions make this in Kassar an outstanding example of a work combining the most characteristic features of Ethiopian literature. The first and most central need of all data entry users is learning XML, TI, and understanding what we do when encoding and what the schema validates. On top of this, there are our project guidelines, which describe the use we make of some elements and reflect some usages and the schema limitations. As most data entry users are unfamiliar with TEI at the beginning of their work in the project, they receive a thorough introduction, which they immediately apply by working on project data, first under supervision by their more experienced colleagues. As they become more familiar with TEI and the project workflow, it is crucial that they not only know to which resources they can refer in questions concerning encoding, but also that they get actively involved into the constant process of editing and refining the guidelines and the schema. This is encouraged by the issue system used within the project, in which all project members can follow each other's concerns and initiate and participate in discussions. The knowledge gained in this way is kept alive, deepened and improved by constant training and workshops, both for the project members and by project members for other researchers. Uh, one such workshop for the other researchers working at the Hiob Ludolf Center of Ethiopian Studies just took place last week. And for this, we had also invited Professor Buda and we hope that he will be able to join us in the future for a similar occasion. To illustrate the work of the data entry users, I will now present how we encode and relate manuscript and work records using as example the Synkasar. In each manuscript record containing an identifiable work, a link to this work's ID is given in the title element. MS items are meticulous, meticulously nested and their IDs have a rigid structure. This is essential to preserve in the XML record the structure of the manuscript as it actually materially appears. Um, as the Synkusar, which as I already mentioned, contains several hagiographies for each day of the year, is much too long to be contained in one single codex. Each codex usually contain, contains only half of the year or three months. To illustrate this partition of one work over several codices, the comparison feature available on our app is very practical. So here you can see uh, several manuscripts all containing the Sinkasar. And you can see at one glance the structure of each manuscript, of course, in the detail as that this particular manuscript is actually currently encoded. And uh, so it becomes obvious, for example, that this manuscript contains three months, starting with the month Tassas, while this manuscript starts with Meskerum. And on this manuscript, we have uh, currently no further information encoded. <laughs> 
the records for the specific recensions, recensions of the Senkesar then contain as far as possible references to the manuscripts which were used for this specific recension in the witness element. The editions are then divided into identifiable text parts, which each receive an ID. So here's the beginning of the edition of the first day of the Sinkasar. The first month is Meskerem, which receives its internal ID here. It is then further divided into several sub-chapters, starting with an introduction, and then with chapters for each day of the month, and these chapters are further subdivided into the single hagiographies of this day. In the manuscript records, anchors uh, are then used to provide references into this main reference. So we address the user's needs for learning TI, XML, and understanding the schema with clear references, constant training, and ongoing discussions. And another major need of the data entry users is the need to quickly enter unprecise data. This is due to the fact that Vitamat Sahif is the first project developing a digital research environment of the Ethiopic tradition. Its priority, therefore, is especially at the beginning to provide a critical amount of data which should be available publicly as soon as possible. And this is expected to significantly facilitate research to allow new questions to be asked and new methods to be adapted. This makes it necessary to quickly enter large amounts of unprecise data which were partly inherited from previous projects or are newly entered now. The web app, therefore, currently deals with a significant amount of incorrect or deviating data. We are very aware of the problems this might cause and address them in several ways, which uh, I will present now. Our schema has been largely modified to accommodate the specific needs of the project. It is therefore no longer canonical TEI, but its main focus is to help data entry and to highlight many easy encoding mistakes. The TEI as entered would not be very much reusable, being full of local IDs and references. But we provide an export in a more explicit TEI record which has our local IDs, but also, also the full URL with the complete information. <coughs> For example, when we enter a bibliographic reference, we use simply a PTR element with a target attribute where we enter a Zotero tag. The bibliographic record is in our Zotero library, and a style sheet or xQuery pulls this data out of the Zotero API when we need it for the web view or for the TI export, which can thus contain the correct will element as exported from the Tiro, and it contains, as you can see, the full URL and the explicit information of this bibliographic record. If we enter a manuscript which contains reference to a work or a person not yet in our records, we systematically create a new record. Thus, we produce a large amount of unchecked data and empty entries, but there isn't much we can do about this at the current stage. Before the project started and in its initial phases, these records were created manually. This occasionally led to problems with ID consistency. We have addressed this now by routinely creating new records through an app editor. For example, in this ownership note of a Sankasar manuscript, the names of the owner, King Sahle Selassie, and his father, his mother, and of the scribe of the manuscript are mentioned. Um, as the king and his parents are important historical personalities, records for them were already part of the data we inherited from previous projects. They could simply be referred to by their already existing IDs. The scribe of the manuscript, however, was not yet known otherwise, and therefore a new record for him had to be created. And the app editor allows us to create a unique and consistent ID and to add very quickly the most necessary information about the person, such as his or her name, some keywords and relations. 
and depending on the amount of information actually available on the person in question, which can be very few, um, the record can then be either quickly checked and saved or more detailed information for which no fields are intended in the app editor can be added directly in the XML file. So we deal with the need for the quick entry of unprecise data by providing an explicit TI export and by creating new records through, an web, through a web editor, which ensures ID consistency. Members of the TRACES project, which is also hosted by the Georg Ludolf Center of Ethiopian Studies, work on morphological annotation and, as I already mentioned, the digital lexicon lingua ethiopica. And for this, they currently edit the Lexicon Lingua Ethiopica in the Dillman app. And these users made the specific requirement to enter data without using XML. And for this, a web editor has also been developed, which allows them to quickly and easily enter all the data they need to develop this app. Another major need that we have is, of course, the continuity of the legacy data. The considerable amount of legacy data which the project inherited contributes significantly to its great benefit for researchers, even at its beginning. And as I mentioned in the introduction, Betemet Sahift has, inher has inherited data from two previous projects, which were also hosted by the Georg Ludolf Center. Within Ethiosphere, over 1,000 manuscripts were digitized and described in a micro database. These descriptions could be integrated into the Betemet Sahif database with an XSLT transformation of the data. The Encyclopedia Ethiopica was published at the Georg Ludolf Center from 2003 to 2014 and its index was transferred to Google Spreadsheets and then also transformed with XSLT to produce individual XML records with unique IDs for all persons, places, and works named in it. Of course, these two projects had widely different aims and technical possibilities, and the merging of the data has led to sometimes conflicting results. For example, a mixed text field in the micro database called Other Details contained uh, miscellaneous information <laughs> Uh, in this case, a remark about a postscript, in other manuscripts, remarks about more detailed remarks about a certain hand or anything else that didn't fit in another field. And uh, this content was transferred into a separate MS item in TEI. Uh, but of course, some of the information needs to be moved to other elements in the TEI header, and this demands careful editing. Therefore, the editing of the legacy data is fully integrated into our workflow. It is assumed that all the inherited data still has to be checked and edited to conform to the schema. The schema itself highlights many of the cases which need editing and therefore become easily spotable. The app is able to deal with incorrect data and reports errors even where the schema cannot. Here, for example, this record was referenced in a manuscript and was then later deleted, but the reference was not updated. And we can see this at one glance at the app. Um, these records which we transformed are, regardless of the errors that they still contain, very valuable even before their editing and the rich information that they contain can already be retrieved. So we ensure the integration of the legacy data into our project by careful editing and error report, both of the schema and the app. The last data entry user need that I'm going to present today is the need for the development of the app. Related to the building of this network of digital resources from the Ethiopian tradition, such as manuscript descriptions, editions of literary works, place descriptions, etc., is the need to develop different interrelated parts of the project in parallel. This is especially true for the development of manuscript and work records, 
as we have seen in the Sinkasar example above. Taking usually historical catalog as the source, records for all manuscripts described for all manuscripts described in this catalog are created. But to precisely encode the manuscript, it is necessary to be able to point to at least minimally completed work records, which list the main recensions and text parts of works. This forces decisions for the structuring of knowledge, which are not easily made. For many works of Ethiopian literature, there is currently insufficient information available which would allow to complete the records in the precise way which is desirable. The identity of all the works contained in a manuscript is very often not immediately clear from the catalog descriptions. So we cannot always make definite pronouncements on the character of a work. We use as a principle to decide which record for literary works should be created, the independent circulation of a unit, which we try to formulate in our guidelines. This theoretical work is absolutely crucial to our ability of correctly encoding manuscripts and works of the Ethiopian tradition. This is due to several reasons. Manuscripts containing only a single work are rare in the Ethiopian tradition as the majority of all manuscripts are multiple text manuscripts. In order to precisely encode these manuscripts and also to develop our clavis, we must have clear criteria of what constitutes a work, a part of a work, or a collection. Uh, the long transmission tradition of many works during which they underwent revisions of varying degrees contributes to the existence of several recensions of the same work. Hagiographical or liturgical collections, which can contain many texts of very different origins and functions, are an important part of the literature. We hope that by developing clear criteria for this and applying them consistently, we are able to describe the Ethiopian literature respecting its specificities and without viewing it through the filters of Western preconceptions. For example, the work Miracles of Mary contains a varying amount of single miracles, which are encoded as text parts of the work record Miracles of Mary. If, however, it is discovered that a particular miracle of Mary appears also alone in a manuscript, it will receive its own ID, which will then be added with a CRESP attribute to the dependent text part ID in the work record. So here you see the comparison feature for two manuscripts, both containing Miracles of Mary. This manuscript contains the collection Miracles of Mary to Amaro Marlia, and then lists the sing single text parts which are present in this particular manuscript. And this manuscript contains a collection of various liturgical quest texts. And among those are two Miracles of Mary but these are here not part of the collection Miracles of Mary. Therefore, we assume that these two miracles also circulate independently and we created records for them where they received their own IDs. We hope that by following this policy, we can ensure consistency and precision while also reducing the need to completely rework descriptions of works and manuscripts each time a new work unit is discovered to circulate also independently. Due to the large amount of data we currently enter and the ease searching for text in our web app, we actually make this discovery quite regularly. In the same way, we have records for works which are perceived as units, like the Octatube, which contains eight biblical books. We can thus have one or multiple editions of the Octatuke, as we can have one or more editions of Genesis, but the abstract work unit is one for each unit. This also helps us to respect each manuscript's individual structure while still being able to point uh, to a stable ID of the work. If we have a manuscript of the Sinkasar, which contains only some parts of it, we can still point to the Sinkasar as a work entity and then more precisely to each of the parts of the Sinkasar which are actually present in this manuscript. And since the order of the text parts can also vary, 
the structure is thus preserved as it appears in each manuscript. And this ther theoretical structure for the edition stays only with the abstract work record. So in this case, here's once again the beginning of the edition of the first day of the Sinkasar, which is with its various text parts. And here is a description of a manuscript containing this first day of the Sinkasar. And there is, for example, this commemoration of John the Baptist and Henoch, which is not mentioned in the edition of, of, on which we based our edition in the work record, but this commemoration is present in this particular manuscript. So we added it to the work edition and it can then be referred to whenever it is needed. Of course, the pitfalls involved by trying to implement the strategy are many. Which text parts also circulate independently and should receive their own ID? Which variation of recensions justifies the creation of a new record? And which degree of variation should be accommodated within a single record? In the case of the Sinkasar, due to the great local variation uh, of hagiographies, each manuscript is practically a recension and the creation of a unit for a specific recension would be justified only by the existence of two manuscripts which have the exact same structure. The difficulty of this approach has also been demonstrated in our work with manuscript and work records of the four Gospels. We had decided that, applying our guidelines for the creation of independent works, that the different introductions, the letter to Carpianos and the canon tables, which all usually precede the text of the four Gospels themselves in Ethiopian manuscripts, should not receive individual IDs because they do not circulate independently. However, when working with several manuscript records, we became aware that the variation between these manuscripts is too high for this approach to be satisfactory. So some manuscripts contain only some of the existing introductions. Here you can see that this manuscript contains the introduction Mekteme Wengel, which was not contained in this manuscript. Uh, and we also had the wish to, uh, to be able to differentiate the different subtypes of the canon tables in a more, more satisfactory method than was possible within a single record. And apart from this, there are also manuscripts which contain only the four Gospels themselves without any of the works usually accompanying them. So we have come to the decision that the possible exclusion of parts of a work also constitutes a sufficient criteria for this part to receive an independent ID. And we hope that this uh, approach helps us to describe the structure of, structure of four Gospels manuscripts in a more satisfactory way. These were the main needs of data entry users as they have come up in the first year of the project. We hope that by constantly reflecting on these needs and by modifying and improving our workflow accordingly, we can ensure consistent and sustainable data entry on which we will be able to build in the future. We try at each step to respect as much as possible the specific features of the Ethiopian tradition without flattening it to Western tradition standards, as for example in the question of what constitutes a literary work, a collection or a canon. This should also improve the experience of end users on whose main needs I will focus now. End users of the project may have varying interests and come from various backgrounds and have very diverse expectations about the project and their possibilities of using it. The website will be accessed by scholars with a background in Ethiopian studies and by those not familiar at all with the Ethiopian manuscript tradition and Ethiopic languages. It will be accessed by Ethiopian and by non-Ethiopian scholars and also by interested members of the public. It is clear and to be expected that the needs of these user groups will differ widely and that not all expectations can be met. But I will now focus on the most central user needs. And as we are still in the first project phase and our web app is not yet public, 
there have been until now much more needs of data entry than of end users. So we have received comparatively few requirements by the few end users which we have until now. Um, however, the project which works uh, on the digital lexicon lingua Ethiopica um, has currently more end users and I will therefore occasionally draw upon it in this section. The central need of all end users is the clarity and accessibility of the website. This is constantly kept in mind while encoding and working on the website layout. Um, yes, and by the way, we have not yet done any styling of the weather. <laughs> so please keep this in mind. So we regularly consult with uh, colleagues in Ethiopian studies who are not directly involved in the project, and we are very open to their requirements, which we always note down and discuss in our issue system on GitHub. One such user requirement has motivated, for example, a split view of a manuscript's intellectual content here and its codicological description, uh, which can also both be hidden. And uh, this was due to the uh, need that most users probably will be interested mainly in the intellectual content and might be confused by seeing the codicological description in the foreground, as had been the case previously in our layout. So all insight by potential end users is extremely valuable to us. And it has also proved that the work in progress character of our website is not immediately clear. And therefore many users have their expectations disappointed at finding that their particular field of interest is not yet fully represented. This cannot currently be changed and will hopefully improve as the project progresses. We are, of course, welcome to free contributions to our data, and any pull request will be evaluated and published. Information taken from catalogues might likewise be confusing, as the descriptions were never homogeneous and occasionally also inconsistent within one catalogue. It might not be clear to end users that these inconsistencies are due to the source material. In order to stress this point and to clarify many other issues, the website will contain an easily accessible how-to section describing its genesis and explaining its use to end users of various backgrounds. The Dillman project, for example, already has such a section which describes the project scope and its use. And we already have detailed help and description for the search. We will develop these sections further as we prepare for publication and receive more requirements by end users. So we address the need for clarity and accessibility by responding to requirements and developing clear how-to sections. Another major need of end users is the accessing and using of homogeneous and sustainable data. This is mainly ensured by using TEI and exporting explicit data, as I had already discussed previously. Bitimat Sahift also has an open access data API, which responds with JSON or XML to several types of queries in order to be easily reusable by other apps. At the moment, the only external user is the Ugarit Translation Alignment Project, which will receive data from our API to allow alignment of Ethiopic text to other translations. While this is directed mainly at developers, it does already benefit end users of the Dillman and Bitimet Sahift apps. For example, this makes it possible to directly view in the Dillman app text that has already been added to Bitimet Sahift records. So that, for example, by clicking here on Psalm 18, verse 16, you immediately get this particular verse because it has already been entered and referenced into the work record of the Psalms of David. And also the title here, Psalms of David, is uh, retrieved from our work records. And similarly, this makes it possible to also view the attestations of the, this particular lemma in the Betamax Sahift corpus directly in the Dillman app. So we also uh, 
ensure the integration of our project within the recent developments in codecology by adapting the nomenclature and framework described in the most recent standard work of manuscript description, La Syntaxe du Codex by Andrist Canard and Maniacci. We address uh, the sustainability of our data by the explicit TI export, by open access data API, and by using the terminology developed in La Syntaxe du Codex. I hope that this presentation showed that most needs of both user groups focus around striving for a balance between entering and using large amounts of heterogeneous data without sacrifice, sacrificing precision, sustainability, and clarity of presentation. Furthermore, the attempt to respect fully the specificities of the Ethiopic tradition poses several problems, both on the side of the data entry and of the end use of the resources. The needs of all users of Betimet Sahift can only be addressed through reflection and discussion. And we are very aware that the project can only be improved when being subject to feedback from many points of view. So we would value all comments and suggestions highly. Thank you. Super, thank you. Dorothea, thank you for a beautifully clear presentation of a project that's intellectually fascinating, but also fundamentally very pragmatic. And I do like this, the balance that you're constantly trying to strike collectively between the inter international sort of standardized expectations mm. such as TEI and those practical needs of the poor people who have to do the stuff. Yeah. Something I can relate to very clearly. Uh, um, focus yes, mm. yes, it's um, sort of to, to lower the barriers as much as possible, yes. I think, for people to join in. Does anyone have any questions for Dorothea? Yeah, sure. Um, or shall I start? Does anyone want to start? No, I was just curious about something. How is, uh, how is the degree of the variations? Uh, you said that the stories, the ideography, uh, all, I mean, there are various versions. How much do they differ from each other? Uh, mainly they differ linguistically very much from each other because there were several translations and rework reworkings of those translations. So it's a large linguistic difference. And um, the single hagiographies which are actually present in most of the manuscripts don't largely differ in their content but each manuscript can contain additional hagiographies. So I was very struck by, so I, I worked, I've been working with similar projects for ancient Middle Eastern texts mm -hmm. for 20 years, rather alarmingly. Um, and I was interested in the fact that you're facing some of the same issues that we faced 20 years ago, such as making TEI workable. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so we still, because we've got sort of you know, a lot of legacy data like mm -hmm. you, are still working with our own system that then exports to mm -hmm. TEI. So yes. this is really it's just an observation yes. that, that, that that sort of thing. So are, are the things that we're tackling at the moment are more to do with user accessibility than mm. rather than um, editorial accessibility, though that's still ongoing as well. So one of the, the big issue for us this summer is, um, is screen accessibility. Okay. So a lot of our users in the Middle East don't have big screens, they're working from portable mm. devices. And this is uh, actually one of our problems because uh, Many people in Ethiopia don't have internet. Yeah. So, and the internet is regularly disconnected. Yeah. So, it has been mentioned already that it would be very desirable to actually have a working offline version of the project. Yeah. Um, so, but also, I mean, I find our users are 
often working on mobile ph phone signals mm. and on, on very small screens. Yeah. Um, so you said, obviously, you haven't started to think about um, visual design very much of your... Well, we have started to think about it, but, it, but I wondered at what point those issues mm -hmm. will come into your conversations with, well, with we users. We hope before the publication, but uh, we probably cannot be, a be able to go public before we have with with a complete solution for all mobile yeah. devices. Yeah. So we, our priority is to go public at some point. Yes. And I yes. think this will be an ongoing development. Yes, um, it's always. <laughs> it will never go away. Any other questions or comments? I want it just to be a conversation between the two of us. Is Pietro is, is Pietro here. Hello. Hello, hello, Pietro. Um, oh, he's he muted at the moment. I wonder if you could say a little bit about your involvement in the project. Um, so we need to turn him on. Be, you have to unmute yourself. Can you? Hello. Uh, What's all that? That was a nice idea. That worked. <laughs> 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 a CP thing is that you can sit on your Yes, we can't hear you, I'm afraid. We think the problem is you're with you, not with us. Sounds like a microphone, Petra. It crackles every time you try to talk, but we don't get any time through it. Let's let's talk a yes, little bit more. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to. I I wanted to ask about the. It's it's this. Do you work to perfection, or do you put in what you can and then work back? Yeah, exactly. So I was wondering what kind of workflow you've worked out for. You've got a big blog, you've got some information about this manuscript. Yes. So do you put that in and then work through it, refining it? It depends actually on the single users. Mm. So we, we all usually work with one catalogue, which each, each uh, user describes. And then some people prefer to enter each manuscript with all its details mm -hmm. and go very slowly through the entire catalog. Other pre others prefer to enter a basic entry for each manuscript, create a general overview of the catalog and of its specificities, and then to start again from the beginning. So, so you so haven't so standardized that particular. No, you just go with the people no. and have a feel. No, exactly. But what? When you publish, yes, we will, go will, with everything, revision. will everything be available, or will you only be publishing no. those things that, you're, that you feel have met your standard? Um, this is something we have often discussed, mm. and uh, some of us would prefer to only publish Polish records that have gone through several revision processes. Um, another idea is to uh, publish everything with clear remarks on the website to please not cite this mm. record, to please consider that this is work in progress. So, yeah. Yes, I prefer the publishing everything thing, partly because mm -hmm. it's more transparent. Exactly. And because the perfect will not be perfect. No, of course not. That's the other thing. The danger is that one assumes there's some you know, you can get to a point and then you're there and it's all everybody can sit back and there's nothing more to do. So like but actually, actually um, I think it's much more realistic yeah, to give mm. people this is what it is, this yes. is what we have. As I said in our first project phase, we are describe, uh, digitizing those historic catalogues, but we plan actually on going through the libraries and checking the manuscripts and mm. adding our own description. So even when we have not finished the digitization of this catalogue, we don't consider these the most perfect manuscripts. So I suppose the is 
very clear indication to the user mm. of these steps. Yes. This is a step one description. Yes. This is a step two. So thinking about mm. how you describe those processes, mm. because we aren't always good enough about describing what we ourselves do. Mm. Yeah, because it's clear um, to everyone. Because for we know that the yes, yes, yeah. it's so obvious to us. But I think that would, could be quite a helpful. Yes. And I often think that we tend to think that self-documentation is an annoying waste of time when it's obvious to us what we're doing. Why should we spend precious time, which we could be editing manuscripts, mm. on writing about how we edit manuscripts? It's like getting the technical preface written. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's the boring bit. This is how we did it. But yeah. it's really important for other yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of comments and a mm. couple of questions for you. Um, Comment was yes, a lot of people use think the other people are going to be using a phone network. So, I mean, responsive design is absolutely essential. Just looking at um, Charlotte's iPad, is it an iPad? Yeah, it's an iPad. Okay, well, iPads come now in three different sizes. That's true, that's going to be on phones. You get the iPad standalone, mm -hmm. you get the iPad mini, and now you get the iPad Pro, the very big one. Plus, the people who just uh, phones. Um, mm -hmm. Those of us that have Androids, of course, you, know, you get those kind of different sizes as well. And some people even have um, um, Windows tablets. Mm -hmm. oh, my fantastic. Um, I, I'm very curious about um, some of the things you said. Just, just to check, did you say that the um, the tradition there now is still for written manuscript rather than printed? The, the, the picture of the guy sitting there with his rock. Yes. So they still write this stuff. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Sorry, that was just I can so, throw that into my teaching. Sorry, that was I just wanted to verify that. That was a beautiful <laughs> photograph, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yes. Fantastic. And still working intensively together with the teachers. Yeah. And you made the interesting point that perhaps partly economically driven. Mm. Yeah. Yes, and it is declining. Books are more expensive than having to go and sit in there. Yes, that's particularly interesting. The, 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 the two other things, the two things you said very, very early on, when you pointed to the to the map and you mm -hmm. were talking about the manuscript tradition, you yes. spoke about the mountains and you were indicating that all these blobs that you had which I assume were the centers of the manuscripts, so the libraries of monuments. Yes, sorry, we're in the centers. mountains area. So the highland area, that's a Because country. why not in the lowlands? I mean, and also the, the Christian tradition, is it because the Christian uh, monasteries and all that are up in the mountains because they used to get well, sacked by, the, by everybody else, all the other invaders? It's certainly easier for them to be up in the mountains in Ethiopia than in other countries. <laughs> To think of, so I don't know. So one was curious about why they were located in the, in the mountains, and then secondly, just to ask about the um, the manuscript tradition because you're clearly focusing on Christian texts. Yes. I mean, is that a choice or is that the tradition? We have well, a, a lot of a lot of stuff about hagiography in there, which is great. Yes, yeah, so we are there, focusing on the Christian tradition. Yeah, but there are Islamic texts. There are yes. Jewish um, texts. There is a Christian texts. So we've got the Ethiopian. Yes, there are uh, many Islamic texts as well, but the the production and the development of the different manuscript traditions is very, very separate for the Christian and for the Islamic texts. So our project focuses on the Christian texts. The Christians are up in the mountains and the Islamists are down the lowlands, no? Yes, uh, Harar is the center of Islamic manuscript mm -hmm. production, for example. And there is currently a project at the University of Copenhagen headed by Alessandro Gori, which focuses on the Islamic tradition, and we, we are cooperating. So maybe we will be able to incorporate these data also in the future. Okay, I'm just curious why it was just Thank you. And in fact, when you say when you make that distinction, is it a distinction of religion or of language? Of both. Mm. But I mean, the two run yes. together. That's one of the other reasons that Ethiopic and Christianity go together, and Arabic and Islam go together. So, so that, that that's one of the reasons why the traditions are so different. I sort of had in mind a sticky bone. Sorry, going back to the mountains versus the plains. They're actually located in different locations. So this is a this is a monastery with a library of Christian texts, and this is a um, Islamic center with the. Um, Yes. Yes, and I mean there are many more 
Christian centers, and it was a, a connected landscape, not not scattered with the different centers of different religions. Religions. And I think this would be a great interest to biblical scholars worldwide because mm -hmm. be interested in looking at the variations, you know, yes, what's different in, in these um, in these um, in these manuscripts of the Bible than we have in the other yeah. in the other traditions. Mm -hmm. Have a bigger audience, I think, when you're on the But also for the height, yeah, also for the hagiographical ha tradition. Yeah, yeah. 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 for waiting to be yeah. dealt with, really, because yeah. it's this relationship between story and the different forms that story takes, and the different languages into which it goes, mm -hmm. and the different combinations of different stories and where they're put. Yeah. And we barely scratched the surface of the challenge of hagiography, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the man you showed us, the scribe. Do you know much? You said he was working with the project. He was working with the Ethiosphere project, but I was not working right. with the Ethiosphere project. So okay. I know that he was also an informant for a colleague of mine who works on Amharic linguistics. Mm -hmm. So during a certain period, I think 2014, mm -hmm. he, uh, he cooperated quite intensively with the project. Yeah. But I don't have any more information about him. So, do you, what? Um, so, so for people like him, do you, or in general, do you get a sense of what value they see in the project and what how they will be using it? Why why is it important for them to have to be able to access these texts beyond the, the text they have in their library? Is that is it about just acquiring yeah. access to more so texts, or are there, is there research involved for them as well? For, for those traditional mm. scribes and copists, I'm honestly not sure. There is, of course, research in, in Ethiopia and the different universities. Yes, yes. That's yes. another yes. question. And there is also an increased awareness now in the university about the, the value of those traditional mm. scribes and what knowledge they can contribute to the general knowledge about the, about the tradition, about the mm. tradition transmission. And of course, to the scribes themselves and everyone else involved in the production of manuscripts. So we still have parchment makers, for example, yeah. binders. Um, there is a lot of uh, it's a lot of this feeling that the tradition which they continue is very important to their identity. Yeah. So we hope that our project will not be perceived as an outside intruding project which applies western standards to the ethiopian tradition which is also why we really focus on try to focus on how the tradition views itself which texts are perceived as texts mm -hmm. in the ethiopian tradition regardless of whether they might that might be the same case in greek mm -hmm. or in syria um, so we we hope that we will they will be able to to value what we can contribute also but I think this is going to be a massive increase in the accessibility, not only of different texts, but as you say, different variants, yes. different essentials of texts. And that's going to, if, for a living tradition, that's going to raise some interesting problems as well as excitement for people. Yes. If you're brought up thinking that you know your own mm. tradition is the one, yeah. then what happens when you discover that it's one of many? Mm. And that, that's, yeah, that, I mean, that's... Mm. Going to be quite quite interesting and there's something to think about. It's a good tradition. So you said uh, this encoded text mm -hmm. will be accessible on your website, but yes. also on some other repositories. And I wanted to ask uh, if this material would be uh, could be incorporated into library catalogs and websites as well. Maybe this is a question for Pietro. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you hear me? Yes. On the, on the reuse, of course, um, yes, it's uh, it's possible to reuse them. There is um, there is no um, limit on the API usage at the moment uh, to retrieve the data of both resources. Of course, um, uh, bearing in mind what the 
uh, the quality level of the data is and what the, the copyright notice is, which is different from, uh, from resource to resource depending on where uh, the data comes from. Um, and there is an image currently uh, to, be, to be reused, which is available. Uh, but the metadata are already uh, there to be, to be reused for, uh, for whoever, um, whichever institution might uh, like to incorporate the data and reuse uh, our, um, our efforts uh, to, to, to encode it. Yeah. Uh, it's in GitHub, uh, first of all, and is a public uh, organization, and that's our first way to, to get hold of uh, the whole thing. And then the API is also publicly accessible, and uh, if anyone wants to, to, um, to use it, it's um, more than welcome. Yes, I think that's a great advantage as well. Sorry? No, I think it's a very good thing, a good additional <laughs> advantage. Um, yeah, we, we also think so. And in fact, it works. In, <laughs> the, the API works better than the app at the moment. So we have <laughs> more effort on, on making it possible to, to reuse that other than, uh, than not on styling our own um, website to interface uh, those things. Um, It also strikes me that this is a very interesting example of how of digitization forcing clarity of thought in general research. Yes. That you, you look at this stuff and you say, I've got this hagiographic manuscript. But once you are setting down and using firm, clear categories to describe the manuscript, all this stuff comes out of woodwork and so say, oh, well, I haven't really thought about what to say about yes. this or that or the other. And I think it's something that one needs endlessly to emphasize is that interplay. Mm -hmm. Because I think the danger of a project like yours is that it sounds as if people are just sitting down with some manuscript catalogs and writing on type, you know, that it's just a glorified typing exercise. Yes. Um, and I think one has to repeat again and again because it's hard for people to understand who haven't done it. Mm -hmm. Uh, th this is actually a transformation, mm -hmm. not just a representation. Yes, we we constantly notice this, I and mean, we we try to develop these criteria um, by also, uh, of course, uh, keeping in mind other uh, other research in the past years, especially in the Syntax Codex. And, but still, with these criteria in mind, we need to have yeah. detailed discussions about each single work. Yeah. So it's, it's never, never an easy process. But it's good for us all and for our research. Absolutely. Absolutely. I also, talking of discussion, I love your use of GitHub for, for editorial discussion. Mm. I've, I mean, our project uses it for editors to report bugs and request mm -hmm. features. But I've never thought of it as a, as a forum for um, for that sort of, that mm -hmm. level of discussion, mm -hmm. so next week I'm going yes. to suggest yes. <laughs> that we steal your ideas. Yeah, it looks brilliant actually because all our editors are on GitHub in order yes. to talk to the programmers, and now they can talk to each other as well. I think that's super. So, um, so again, it blurs that distinction, which is good. Yes, it, it does, and it helps it helps the editors get a little bit yes. familiar, more familiar with. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I mean, we use that in libraries as well. Do it's you? also very yeah. really useful to cite, you know, when you're writing yeah. whatever, to cite the issue. You just yeah. link to the issue and yeah. it out. Yeah. Right. Gabby. Can I, can I ask a question about the, um, the prosopography? Yes. Um, so, just sort of generally, um, two, two questions, both very open. What, um, what sort of information is is captured for each personal record mm -hmm. in your prosopographical data, and secondly, what what state is it currently in? Um, I, I take it it's still early in the project, mm -hmm. um, but at what point do you think there may be at least part of the prosopography would be would be considered stable? I won't say finished, but, but ready. Yes, I think that we could say this already for a part of it. So especially one of our colleagues, Solomon Gabriel, who is also a historian, has worked on this. And uh, he has started by filling in the records of important historical figures of which he knew that they were involved in manuscript description, and then spread out to other often, often again and again referenced historical personalities. 
And he uh, usually adds, well, of course, the name, variations of the name, any dates we have, and any references to places. And then he uh, spends uh, a great deal of his work while trying to encode the relations between the persons and other persons, and between the person and work records, places. Um, one of these um, uh, this person records, yeah. Yes. If I mean, um, uh, it's the part of the work that has the, um, received the, the attention for um, largely uh, it's um, um, a list of persons at the moment more than a prosopography I would say but it will become a prosopography um, in uh, in the future but we we're very welcome uh, welcoming uh, any sorts of uh, of input on that but for the moment it's still uh, pretty much a, um, a list of uh, linked names and, uh, and person records uh, also, because we do not have um, uh, marked attestations of uh, names in text, for example, which we could use, uh, because we didn't have any text until now, only metadata. And uh, we are starting now to have uh, uh, a dozen of texts which we can uh, which we can mark up uh, to make some, uh, um, at least from my point of view, meaningful use of uh, of this uh, uh, reference list of person, uh, which we at the moment have. Um, do these manuscripts tend to have colour forms? I mean, useful colour forms. Some manuscript have, manuscripts have colour forms. They tend not to be very detailed. Right. So occasionally there is clearly stated who the scribe was or who the owner or the patron mm -hmm. was. Sometimes there are simply prayers for a certain person and his family's name, uh, family's members, and we, we don't actually know if that was the scribe or the owner. And sometimes dates are mentioned, but not very often. Not very often. So may I, if anyone else want to join now, or want to continue this conversation, thinking about what you said about the problems with linking with legacy data. Yes. And your, the, the big dictionary, etc. And you're rolling your eyes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so, and you, you very quickly said there are problems. I don't want to talk about it. But maybe you could say a little bit more about what sorts of issues you're finding. For instance, with the big multi-volume, uh, it was an encyclopedia or a dictionary, the big encyclopedia. Yeah. Was it index we transformed? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, so one of the issues we have is the transcription of names yes. is often Yeah, we very also different. changed our transcription system, so we need to manually edit the transcription yeah. of all these inherited records. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a lot of work. And uh, another issue is that uh, in the index, other criteria to what constitutes a work were applied than those which we have developed mm -hmm. by now. So we have many yeah. records of works which we don't consider works, but we are lacking records of works which the encyclopedia <laughs> didn't consider works. So, so you can't it's good because we have a large amount of base data that we can build upon, but mm -hmm. Really, really needs a lot of editing. And is this is the encyclopedia project finished? Yes, or so it's yes. Not, you're not no, feeding the last back volume was, yeah. was published in 2014, which mm -hmm. contained this yeah. very, very great and helpful index. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, because at the beginning of the table in Google uh, um, that uh, Eugenia, our uh, coordinator, had put together with a uh, great effort which was converted into the initial uh, data set for us. So um, of all those entities that are there, um, still a good 95% is a genius work uh, at the beginning from those indexes, yeah. So just to, to acknowledge that uh, uh, undertaking. And is there a gazetteer of Ethiopia that you use for places? Or are you just making your own place list? Um, the, there is now um, uh, a Pelagius uh, uh, Gazetteer Interconnection format uh, uh, published in our uh, GitHub repo and available also as a dump um, online. 
and we also export annotations um, for uh, all the works which have annotations, so manuscripts especially, and uh, the Chronicle of Galaudios, which our colleague uh, Solomon Gabriel Bayene has annotated with place name uh, in the framework of a mini grant we received from the Pelagios Commons. Um, so that that one is uh, is just freshly uh, being um, um, done. The gazetteer was was uh, completed in its format, um, and therefore then continuously updated with the data that uh, uh, it receives from uh, from the TI just uh, last week, uh, so to say. Uh, but there is um, it's there, and I hope that the the the, the colleagues in. Uh, um, Pelagios will be already able to, to use some of that uh, um, as soon as they, uh, they see my emails notifying that uh, we've got this, this data out there. Um, to, uh, to collect the coordinates um, and uh, some of the data that we uh, do not uh, personally enter, so we do not uh, enter as a project, we use some, uh, some ideas referencing, uh, but then uh, um, our gazetteer reproduces uh, more or less uh, um, uh, faithfully, uh, the, the structure of uh, the uh, guidelines for encoding uh, um, geohistorical information of the Syriaca project. So our TI files are almost exactly like uh, the ones of the Gazetteer of uh, Syriaca.org. And then we export uh, those uh, records, both as a Gazetteer uh, with um, uh, all the variant uh, names and the abstract place and the um, multiple locations or names for a given place, and then we export a GeoJSON um, in the, um, uh, which should validate to the to the um, Pelagios, um, uh, no, sorry, not the Pelagios, the, the Pleiades uh, schema. Um, and um, yeah, and we're very happy about it. We also have a KML uh, export for the places, which we use with the um, Daria EU uh, Geo Browser uh, to visualize, for example, uh, places that are mentioned in a chronicle, like the Chronicle of Galaudios, but with a date relative to the context of the work, uh, which means then that in our um, small uh, uh, geo browser uh, map, we see eventually the dated places that are mentioned in the chronicle relative to the chronicle. Um, we had, the, um, uh, my, from my point of view, a rather interesting discussion on the TI list about uh, uh, how to um, to encode this, and we we ended up doing that and. Um, at least uh, the colleagues are uh, happy with what is coming out of it and this visualization of what's, uh, what's actually uh, the attestation of the places in the, the time relative to the text um, as a third uh, place output for, um, for our place records and work records. I'm not sure if I answered, but I tried to. Oh, thank you. I think we should. Any last burning questions or comments before we call a halt? I think um, we should thank Pietro and uh, Dorothea both very, very much indeed. It's a splendid project. Thank you all, not just, it's not just the two of you, so all of your colleagues. Thank you very much. And thank you in particular, Dorothea, for that beautiful presentation that raised uh, so many issues that we've been thinking about all summer now, um, but you Nevertheless, despite the fact that you're the eighth or ninth, I've lost count, you still gave us new things to think about. So um, thank you enormously for coming. And thank you also for coping so calmly yeah. with, the, with the last minute uh, rescheduling. So thank you indeed, very much indeed. Thank you all for your input.